Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is uh, Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Stephen, with you with this week's Ten Minute Torah. And this week we start a new book of the Torah, Shemot, or as you, as we all know in English, Exodus. This is where where the Hebrew people, the Israelites, go from becoming being a family to being a nation. Now, a couple of things, uh, just kind of FYI, I am going to be on vacation Monday through Wednesday, um, leaving messages at the office. I'll get back to you. Also, um, my office hours are going to change a little bit, or they have, as some, some of you noticed. I am in typically Monday and Tuesday, usually around 9, 9.30 to about 1 or 2, somewhere around there, Monday to Tuesday. Uh, and depending on the week, I will either be in on Thursday, same time, or what I'm starting to do too, now that the day, the daylight, the sunlight is ending earlier and we have the candle lighting, I'm starting to come in instead of Thursday morning. I'm here Friday afternoon and I stay here for services that way. We can light the candles and say the bona fide blessing and not have it in vain. So, um, And as you might notice too, now that we're at the end of December, the daylight time of the day is getting longer. So the candle lighting time is getting uh, later and later. Ultimately, what I would like to do when uh, we start services and, you know, hopefully we'll continue to keep going at 7.30 is maybe we'll start services a little bit earlier, maybe 7, 7.15. And that way we can get the guitar out before we actually, you know, usher in Shabbat. We can do some singing. and You know, a lot of you have said you'd like to see that happen. So um, I'd like to do that as well, add a little bit more spice to our services. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Saturday morning right now. Same as usual. Um, the one thing I'm going to say, and this may end up being addressed, is that, you know, Saturday morning, uh, we start at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, 11.05 sometime we take out the Torah. I would ask that if you're going to come to Saturday morning services, please be there before the Torah service. That way we can focus on the Torah. We don't get interrupted by the bell going off. People don't have to leave and find out who's there. So um, I'm going to ask that we do that. Some synagogues actually do that. I've been in synagogues where they, you know, it, it's it's a disruption. It's an interruption. And they say, no, if you're not here by the Torah service, then you wait. Uh, when I was growing up, we had people standing by the door and they didn't let you in while the, while the Torah was being read. So uh, anyway, we'll we'll get to that when we get there. So shame up. So now uh, the, the Torah being the five books of Moses, now we get to meet Moses. And a new Pharaoh arises who knew not Mo, who knew not Joseph. So a lot of folks think that this is really the beginning of bona fide anti-Semitism, where you've had a previous ruler that was going to face some hard economic times. What do they do? They call in a, well, let's call him Jew, because that's ultimately what we become, Jews, you know, to help out. And Joseph basically saves Egypt, you know, with his smart managing of the grain and his financial Acuity, he managed to, to save Egypt. People come to Egypt to get grain. Uh, Egypt thrives. So as the history books tell us, and some of the sages have woven this into the commentary and the story about the Exodus, there uh, the pharaoh of Joseph was from the Hyksos dynasty. They were Bedouin conquerors. They came into Egypt. They became part of the society. They basically took over the government. And it was their reign uh, that Joseph served. Years later, the Egyptians overthrew the Hyksos, and the new pharaoh that knew not Joseph was one of the was a native Egyptian from the native dynasty. So naturally, they distrust the Jews. They distrust the Israelites. So what do they do? They enslave them. As Pharaoh says, "Let us enslave them, lest you know, if in case some conquerors come in, they don't join with these conquerors, you know, to defeat, help defeat us." You know, the Israelites were part of society. You know, most of them lived in Goshen, but a lot of them, you know, were were part of the Egyptian capital at the time. Um, they had friends that were Egyptians. Why would they do that? It's just an example of xenophobia. So Pharaoh enslaves the uh, the Hebrews, and he does, and, and they mul we multiply. Seventy souls go down to Egypt, and now there's millions of Israel couple of million in, in Egypt, and they're worried. They say, what are we going to do to stem this growth? The more we afflict them, the more we make them work, 
you know, the more fruitful, <laughs> the more the more Israelites are born. And one of the things that's one of the commentaries about this is, you know, you read in the Torah that uh, uh, our ancestors were put to work, you know, to build buildings. Some people say it was the pyramids. That's, to my knowledge, been disproven. Anybody have another thought? Please let me know. Uh, but basically, they built granaries. They built some buildings. Uh, but most of the work was for naught. It was just make work. You know, I, some of the uh, movies of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you see a chain gang. What are they doing? They're digging a ditch. Then they're filling it up. It's just to break their spirit. And that's basically what they did with the Israelites to break this, to weaken their resolve, because they saw how, how resilient mentally, emotionally, and spiritually we were as a people. But didn't change anything. So Pharaoh's like, well, we're going to start killing every firstborn. You know, that way they can't multiply. The girls will be born. They'll interweave with Egyptians. They'll marry Egyptians, and that'll be the end of the Israelites. Well, that didn't work either because you had some uh, midwives, women that were responsible for helping with the birth. Some people say it was Miriam and, um, and Jochebed, who would be, it was Moses' sister and mother, respectively. And they said, oh, by the time we get there, the kids are born, so we're good. And Pharaoh says, well, then just throw the baby boys in the, in the night. So, Jochebed, who gave birth to Moses, now she had already given birth to Miriam and Aaron, and then the edict comes down to kill all the firstborn. She wants to save her baby, puts him in a basket, right? Just like Noah, we're, we're remembering Noah. Noah goes into an ark, and in a way, Moses goes into an ark too, sails him down the Nile, Miriam is, is watching from a distance, and Pharaoh's uh, presumably teenage daughter sees the baby, loves him, you know, looks at him, it's love at first sight, she wants to adopt him, you know, she's got a soft spot in her heart, and she wants to raise him. Miriam's far out there, she recognizes, Pharaoh's daughter recognizes this is a Hebrew child, and Miriam says, well, we've got a Hebrew uh, woman that will wean the baby, it turns out that it's Moses' mother. So the, it, Pharaoh's daughter names him, um, in the art scroll, it says she names him Monios, which is the Egyptian word for Moses, and the idea, it comes from the root root word of drawn from the water. So Moses is now being weaned and raised in Egyptian royalty. He's trained like an Egyptian that will someday become royalty. And Moses is out there and there's a part of him maybe that, you know, the, the Torah says he goes out to see his people. Now that's a little vague and it's one of the gray areas that we'll probably end up discussing. Um, but how do you know this was his people? He might have felt an instinctive kinship. Or maybe he just was one of these people that believed that all men are brother, all women are sisters. You know, all humans are part of really the same family, which we are. You know, God's our father, so we're all brothers and sisters on this planet. Maybe other planets too, I don't know. And he goes and he sees an Egyptian taskmaster just absolutely abusing, brutalizing uh, an Israelite uh, slave. So he ends up striking the Egyptian taskmaster. Egyptian taskmaster died and buries him. Next day comes back, sees two other Israelites fighting with each other. And those two Israelites, uh, according to the Midrash, was Dathan and Abiram, who would end up, you know, once they're in the wilderness, being part of a rebellion against them. And Moses tries to break them up and they look at him and they say, you know, who are you? You killed an Egyptian taskmaster. Moses is now a little worried. It gets back to Pharaoh that, you know, his uh, member of the royal family killed an Egyptian taskmaster. So Moses leaves Egypt, ends up in Midian, far into uh, almost where Canaan is, Canaan. And there he uh, ends up in a well. And uh, Jethro, a Midianite priest, his seven daughters come to draw water. They're harassed by these shepherd men. Moses gets up and defends him. And the girls, the women go back and tell their father, oh, an Egyptian saved us. You know, he's like, how are you back so fast? An Egyptian saved us. A lot of sages say that this is the reason why Moses was not to be buried in the promised land, because when they identified him as an, Egypt, as an Egyptian, as opposed to Joseph, he didn't correct him. He didn't say, well, I'm really an Israelite. Now, some might say, well, did he really know he was an Israelite at that point? Maybe he suspected, maybe he didn't, because it's only later on after he marries Zipporah, who is Jethro's oldest daughter, Jethro being the Midianite priest, and... Uh, and, and he's confronted by the burning bush that he sees he has a vision of God. God is the burning bush, the bush that burns but is not consumed. 
And God says, I've seen the plight of my people. And I remember my, my um, covenant with Abraham, Isaac, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will set these people free. I will deliver them to the promised land. And Moses says, well, I'm not your guy. And God says, yes, you are. Uh, after arguing, after showing him some wonders, turning his staff into a snake, puts his hand in his, in his, in his a tunic, pulls it out, and it's leprous, pulls it back, and it's fine. Uh, pours out water, it turns into blood. Uh, he goes up, he meets up with Aaron, and we know the rest of the story. He and Aaron get the elders, they go to confront Pharaoh, they say, let our people go. God said, we want to go to three days in the wilderness to a festival for Hashem. Um, Pharaoh says, I know not your God, and he may not have, because the Egyptians knew all the 70 nations, they knew their religions, this was new. So in a way, he wasn't really lying. But the point is, he sees with disdain, he says, no, not only that, you're just trying to get out of work. And in fact, because you're getting out of, because you be trying to get out of work, I'm going to make the Israelites do their bricks, but they're going to have to get their own straw. And now the people are all upset, they're angry, they resent Moses and Aaron. And Moses says to God, look what I've done. God says, don't worry. I'll take care of it. So that's how uh, Exodus is starting. We won't have a Torah study this week. We will have it next week, and we can certainly talk about it then. Okay, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening.